Today we start the activity in room A2 with the lecture entitled There is more than football, beautiful game theory. Soccer or football and economics. World's most popular sport and the main topic in news programs since 2007. Do they have something in common? Ignacio Palacios Huerta claims that data obtained on a football pitch can be very useful for research in economics. He is professor of management, economics and strategy at the London School of Economics, as well as member of the governing board of Athletic Club de Bilbao. No, tiramos la. Also, apologies, my mic was off. I'm sorry. I don't mind. Sorry, sorry. It was my mistake. Apologies. Ah, okay, okay. You got that. Okay, fine. Oh, nobody's doing that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, my, my, my apologies. It was, the microphone was not working. Okay, he's going to go on and ask uh, for the translation. Okay. Excellent. So I'll continue in Spanish. Economy is not what one can see in the news or in the newspapers. In fact, economy, it's very similar to physics, actually. Very, very similar. When we study it, we don't realize it, but we, it is so. We use mathematics. Why? Well, because math and the language of logic uh, we need, it can, has to be used, and the theories cannot work if we don't use this tool. And mathematics to translate these, these theories, and depending on the data we're using and the terminology, we will verify statistics with the data. That's the first idea I'd like to give you. Economics is very similar to physics. In the methodological point of view, it's identical theory in maths because it's the language of uh, maths and data, statistics and econometrics to verify them, yes or not. And the difference between maths and physics is that we are dealing with behavior, people's behavior, not with objects, but the methodology of it is the same. And of course, it's not, we're not talking about Greece coming in or out of the euro, staying in the euro or not, inflation, deflation, the, the stock exchange going up and down. Of course, that's also economy, but it's not only that. How can football help economy? Well, I'll give you two examples of physics. If you remember, when we were studying the first laws of uh, gravity, Newton was there, and Galileo, Galilei, were always there. Galileo was throwing stones from the Tower of Pisa, and Newton was looking at what speed apples fell from trees. That's how the first theories were assessed. These people, these gentlemen, had no interest in apples in stones or in anything but they had amazing figures for their theories for their physical theories of course they were interested in universal data but they didn't write about apples they didn't write about stones they were just the right tools for their theories well here it's exactly the same. Really, we're not too keen on knowing the origin of data. Apples, football, sports, stones, humans. We don't really mind. We only want the data, not necessarily the origin. It really doesn't matter. If a theory is right, it's right in all areas. Apple, with apples, with stones, with in a football field for the economists. And today I wanted to talk about four theories of human behavior. Well, I really like to talk about more theories, but we'll just talk about four that we can validate for the first time with data from sports and fo with football data. And I'd like to refer to the first one, 1991, with Gary S. Becker, with whom I could work in the University of Chicago. 
who, he quotes this area when defining what is economics. He says, it's not, economics is not a science, it's an approach, it's a way of thinking. And he says that what most distinguishes economics as a discipline from some other discipline is not the subject matter, but its approach. And the economic approach is applicable to all human behavior. And this is so, any human behavior can give us data. It's potentially useful. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how football can help economics. If we think about it, sports are amazing, at least as a source of data. It's almost a perfect lab. There's lots of data more and more, actually. Objectives are clear. Behavior can be observed. They're going to take their game very seriously. And subjects are experts in what they are doing. They know what they are doing. Imagine we're taking data in banks or in countries Many of these variables cannot be obtained. What are the objectives of Greece nowadays? How often do we get such, such a situation? Once every 20, 30 years, objectives might not be very clear. We might not be able to see clearly where and how people are behaving. But sports, it's amazing, at least from starting point. And then I'd like to talk how empirically, in the world of football, data can be contra contrasted or not for, with four theories on human behavior. And the fun is not that if this has already been done before, it has. But we are doing this for the first time. For the first time, with this type of data, we can validate or not certain theories that are relevant for economics. First theory has to do with Nash and von Neumann and penalties. You'll remember Nash from A Beautiful Mind and eh, An Amazing Mind, the film. He passed away eh, recently, and you may remember him persona, too. Pues en un de tráfico, After an amazing eh, life, he passed y, uh, away in a bueno, pues, traffic Nash accident, a car accident. And Nash and his predecessor, von Neumann, are relevant for a certain reason. But why? Why Why is this? Oh, they've had a very interesting life, as many others. Nash is very popular in economics because he developed a theorem. And this theorem that he did is very relevant for economy. He proved by generalizing an idea of von Neumann, I'm sure he, if he had been alive at the same time as Nash, he would have also received the Nobel Prize. He wrote this theorem in 10 pages and then simplified it to two pages. And he proved that any strategic situation has a balance. If you manage to do this, you get a Nobel Prize. What is a strategic strategy? What is balance? Well, a strategic situation is one where a behavior that's optimal for people, and I can refer to people, to a bank, to a team, to a family, to a government, a country, an agent. What is optimal for an agent depends on what's optimal for their competitors. If there can be two, three, n competitors, there can be many competitors, actually. If what is optimal for me depends on what is optimal for B, person B and C, and what's optimal for all is depends on what we are all doing, we could be going round and round of what is optimal forever and ever. There's no reason why this should be a process that could come to an end. Well, Nash says that every strategic situation has a balance, and we all tend to go to that balance. So 
relational behaviors lead to that situation. Every agent, that would be a certain uh, a starting point, a calm position would be in which no agent would have any motivation to do anything different. We'll have N banks with N strategies of the whatever complexity, and there is one balance. And that's an amazing result. It's a fantastic beauty. It's almost artistic beauty. Because that theorem has amazing beauty, really. 1950 generalizes a concept from von Neumann. Every situation has balance. One part of this theorem requires that agents don't only perform one action, that they actually mix different actions. They have mixed strategies. This person gets a Nobel Prize, this they get a film made, gets an Oscars. Even though in 1950 it was published, it was not until 53 years later, in 2003, nobody verified if his law is, uh, it can be applied. No, nobody has um, verified this. Sometimes I buy, sometimes I sell, sometimes I make promotions, sometimes I don't. Sometimes as part of an optimal strategy, we need to mix strategies. And when is the time that this theorem is verified? Well, in 2003, I was lucky to be the author of this verification. And with what data? Well, with similar data to apples and stones, with football. With now, penalties data. I was in the Stanford University. I thought about this. And five years later, I took information. I collected information for five years on penalties. I could contrast. And I could have an academic formula. And it was very relevant because it was the first time that Nash theory was confirmed with real data. I don't want to frighten you, but this is a penalty. The simple version of a penalty, there's two players, I and J. They can take two strategies, left or right, and these are the frequency at which the objective is reached or not. Goal frequency, when you see a real penalty and you add the data one will be the goalkeeper and the other the kicker. We can have more possibilities. Left, center, right. We can even have nine by nine, up, down, middle. Well, we've got a matrix there, two by two, three by three, it doesn't matter. With real data, we can actually include data in this matrix. This would be the goalkeeper that we're pointing here chooses left or right. The kicker chooses left or right. And this is when both choose left. 58 are goals, 42 not goals. When both choose right, 70 goals, 30 are not goals. When the kicker cheats on the, on the goalkeeper, most of the times, 95% of the times, it's a goal. We've got a theoretical matrix with real data. We can solve what is the Nash balance. And there's some predictions, some forecasts. In five minutes, I can't really tell you great detail, but the balance of Nash predicts that kickers should throw should kick 38% to the left and predict that goalkeepers should go around 42% to the left and the rest to the right. That would be the Nash forecast. We're talking about penalties because penalties can give us data to validate an economic figure. It's not just because we like football. We do like football, but we're talking about economics. Nash predicts that the goalkeeper should have 42-58, kickers, 32-61. And what do players do? 
after collecting around 1,500 penalties. If you like football, I've got a huge database of around 11,000 goals and penalties. And with 1,500, it's more or less enough to verify. This was a key situation in 2001. It happens to be that players would have to have, well, it's 42.3 when we check on real frequencies observed. We've got 42.3, 57.7. How can a player, a goalkeeper, that has 42%, 42 is not a 50-50, it's a strange figure. They do actually 42.3, 57.69. And kickers, they do 39, almost 40, they do 60. These are apples and stones. That without knowing this, they obey gravity. These are football players that without knowing it, they obey the law, Nash theory. A lay on human behavior, very simple, of course, it deserves a Nobel Prize. And football players, most football players, not all of them, but most of them do, they almost follow strictly what Nash said. 2003, from the scientific point of view, I had already moved to Brown University from Stanford, and when one receives this type of result, Nash theory is verified for the first time with penalty data, the only thing we can do is close a PC or laptop and go for a beer. We had to celebrate. It's not very often that there's an economic theory that can be verified and that is actually verified with football data. Economists don't really care if it's football data or any other data. What we want is good data, and that's what I did. We could go much more in depth, into detail. You can find this information in my web page. You can go into the micro figure of each player, how well they comply with the theory. We've got different statistics here. Del Piero, Zidane, Messi, Ronaldo, Arteta, Semi Prieto. We can check exactly who follow more strictly the theory. They follow it, even though they don't know. And when they don't follow it, it's quite easy to take advantage of it. We've got Peter Seg, Valdez, Lehmann, Van de Sar, any goalkeeper. This was a great success in economy because for the first time it is verified, a very important theory that we all assumed as truth, but that nobody had been able to verify. Just think about the fact that it would have been so hard to obtain this type of data, this quality data, in banks, in economies, in governments, in countries. Then data may obey or not, but at least the data are good, and actually they confirm theory. If you really like football, and it does happen in my case, we can implement this theory to football in general. In 2008, I worked as a consultant in, for Chelsea. For, in the, I also worked in, in the South Africa World Cup. There's also a report, penalty, Nash penalty, in the Robinson report. But scientifically, what is relevant is for the first time, theories are verified. When I see a penalty now, I can see the penalty, but I can also see Nash. And I know if that player obeys or follows the theory or not. Normally they do. Well, second theory. Second theory for which data, economic data, are relevant, financial economy. In the year 2013, three people received the Nobel Award. Two of them were lecturers of mine. 
Eugene Fama and Lars Hansen, and one that was not my professor, but he's a friend, Bob Schiller. It was a peculiar Nobel Prize, at least in the academic world, because even though Hansen is a very technical econometrist, Fama and Schiller are more intuitive. And they say opposite things. They say and bring evidence of contrary situations. One may think that there are three Nobel Prizes. It was very controversial because they say very different things. Mr. Fama says that financial markets are quite efficient, and Schiller says that they're quite inefficient. They're bubbles, etc. They have one third of the Nobel Prize each of the same Nobel Prize. Well, what is theory of efficient financial markets? Without getting much into depth, they say that prices observed in an asset incorporate immediately all the relevant news for that asset. If we see how the euro is, or Iberdrola, or any other shares, if the market is efficient, we can't do much more. We cannot obtain any advantage. Because whatever is known is included in the price. There's no delay, adjustment in what all that can be informative, because it's already included in the price. It's almost impossible. How can we give a Nobel Award to two people that say almost opposite theories? Well, because it's almost impossible to validate this theory. Because it says that everything that is relevant can be included in the price. What is relevant and what does included mean? What are relevant news? How do we know the exact moment in which those news have been created, have arrived, have been made public? How can we know that something has happened that makes the bond, the euro bond, rise? And what's worse, no news also have an, a component, a news component. Why are no news also potentially news? Well, the best way of explaining to you this is tra telling you a traditional tale from Sherlock Holmes called Silver Blaze that talks about this research investigation on the death of a, a horse, a racing horse. This horse was found dead the night before the race, and Gregory asked. Uh, Holmes, si, bueno, ¿hay otra cosa que There's some details de, around. He says, is there any point which you'd want to draw my attention? Asked Mr. Gregory. Ah, Holmes says, well, to the curious incident de, of the dog de, in the de, night time. And Gregory said the dog did nothing in the right time, the in, the in the night time. So Holmes said, then, well, that's exactly the curious incident. Well, no news. The fact that nothing happened was relevant. How can we assess this theory if we cannot really assess the, how precise, instant precise, precise, precision, if it's difficult to document no, news, and if no news also can be considered news and can have an informative component? So we're saying that everything adapts immediately, but to what? What news? That's why we can give an award, a Nobel Prize, to people saying very different things. We've got a solution for this, football. Unfortunately, I'm not the writer of this article, but it says we've got a situation in which time stops and something, informative, some, and the informative element happens just before it stops. And that's the bet market in the break time, just when something very informative is happening, for example, a goal. Very rarely, just before the break, there's a goal. Relevant time stops. 
There's 15 minutes there that nothing happens. But just there, just before that minute, that second, something has changed. And that has ch will ha change the assets, the value of the assets. The purchase, the purchase time continues, but relevant time continues, uh, is stopped. If the theory that we were talking about is true, we would have to ask, do they leap up? Do they incorporate it immediately? And during those 15 minutes, does the price stay constant or does it adapt? Is it really an immediate adjustment? Because we know nothing is happening during break time. And we can assess this. This is something we can assess in this football market. It can be in any other sport, too. When there's a very relevant event just before the time stops, well, Karen Cropson and Ray James Reilly last year published an article in which they assess the theory of efficient markets. We have to remember that even though there is being a sale and purchase of actions, of shares, of bets in this case, that depend on the final result, the price should stay constant. If we put in a graph, the first match in the one at the top, I'm not sure if you can see it properly, it's a Manchester Tottenham, Tottenham Manchester, correction by the speaker, Tottenham slightly ahead. It's very difficult, by the way, to find this type of data, but looking back in the three last decades, we can find around 150 matches where this happened. It took months to find this data. Well, but it, it was worth investigating and looking for this research field. Tottenham was slightly ahead. They were home, playing at home. Zero, 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 zero. Just before the end of the first part of the game, there's a goal. In the break time, huge. This is a, these are data from from bet and win, bet fair. This is the volume. There's, there's lots of bets being placed. Is the price, has this leap been in a second or in a immediate, and is this constant? Well, yes, I couldn't reject the hypothesis. This is a straight line. Prices immediately incorporate to the new situation, and this is a flat line. We have here an Arsenal West Ham. Arsenal very much ahead, favorite for the match. Well, as time goes on, 0-0, zero, zero, it goes down. Nil, nil, but just before the break, there's a drop of the, in the possibilities of West Ham winning. And is this, my question would be, is this a statistically constant price? Yes, that's the answer. We've got here two more, Man Manchester United, Chelsea, end of the the final of the Champions League, 2008. Slightly hit Chelsea, goal of Manchester. There's a slight increase just in the break. When there's one of these events, bets stop. Trading stops for about two minutes. It doesn't really necessarily have to be just in the right second. It could actually be in the last two minutes of the, of the match. Is this it's a huge volume, as you can <coughs> see? You go on the internet and cut off call on the phone. Huge volume. And my question then would be, are these prices constant? And the answer is yes, wherever you go. If you do econometric tests and their hypothesis, this hypothesis is validated. This is Spain, Russia in the 2008 World Cup. Spain, 1-0, 2-0, one just before the break. 100% of probability that Spain would end up winning Russia. Is this price during break time constant? Yes, the answer is yes.
No, pues esta es la primera, la primera, eh, la primera demostración empírica de que. So this, this is the first empirical demonstration that at least this market is very efficient. And it needs high volume of data in, able, in order to be able to assess the opportunities. The third theory is related with behavioral economics. This is about incorporating emotional aspects in the behavior of human beings. In 2002, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Daniel Kahneman, to a psychologist author of Thinking Fast and Slow, his work has been has had an impact in some aspects, but not in all aspects. And a common critic to his works is to what extent are psychological variables changeable or tend to disappear when the human being has an experience, has learned from situations, has the right incentives, and there are competitive situations where only the fittest survive. So sometimes this is not very relevant when people understand. There is one situation which is perfect in sports that we can use for assessing whether this is true, that with the experience and learning and incentives, these effects tend to disappear. That's a um, penalty series. This is very interesting for an economist because we can establish causality like in natural science. We randomize who received a treatment. It's like if we had 100 mice, we have 50 with a drug and 50 without the drug, and then we measure the difference in the effects. Here, it's the same. For some people, I'm going to give them a treatment. The treatment is the order. Some of them will, have, will shoot first, and the others will shoot second. In 1970, there was a decision that after a match finishes in a draw, there will be a penalty series. And in 2003, players cannot choose. And depending on a coin, when you toss a coin, you shoot first or second. I've been able to find information about 1,000 penalty series. So you would say the penalties are a lottery. But is it a 50-50 lottery, or is there some difference? This is perfect. It's run, the order is randomized. If order is important, then we will should see that there is no 50-50 situation. And if the order does not matter, then we should see results of a 50 and 50. So the data should confirm that 50% uh, 50 time, 50 of times wins one team and 50 times the other. So this is a lottery, but not a 50-50, but, but a 60-40. 60 times, 60% 60 of times the, one, the team that threw first won, and 40% the other team. So uh, this depends on tossing a coin, so we can confirm that this difference is only due to order. There might be other factors that affect but we can cannot know about them but we do know we do know that order matters we toss a coin and then one team throws first and the other goes second it's a 60 40. of course this variability is different in world cup in european championship but the average is always close to 60, 40. But it is clear, but this is not 50 and 50. 
It's a 60 and 40. So, um, for the team that throws second, it's still all right because it's a 40 percent. This is a high percentage. As you've seen last week in Copa America, the team shooting second won the penalty series. But it is true that the team that shoots first has more possibilities. So this shows for the first time, again, that even in situations when they are, are very competitive, uh, they do not affect, are, they are not affected by risk. It's just one shot. These players are experts. They've been practicing these shots for 30 years. So we need to know if psychology is important. Players know. They, they know this. They rather shoot first to put pressure on the second team. And they know. They know that shooting first is good. We want to not talk about football or design of mechanisms. The question is, if until 1970, until the year 1970, the question is, why are we using a, a coin? Why are we tossing a coin if this gives a difference? We should use uh, neutral mechanisms. But, for example, imagine we have two teams, A and B. If we use a system which is A, B, A, B, A, and B, that results in a 14-60 situation. So the question is, is there something that we can do so that the coin tossing does not have a psychological effect, meaning that the order does not affect the result of the penalty series or the performance of players. And the answer is yes. And I'll try to explain it. The actual order, A, B, A, B, that will be Argentina, Brazil, for example, this results in a 60 and 40 percent. If the order A, B gives an advantage to A, what should happen in the second pair of penalties in order to compensate this advantage? Well, the idea is if A, B gives an advantage to advantage to A, the next one should be BA, so we compensate. With the second pair, we compensate the first pair of penalties. Because there is a trend that A is first and B is second, and we compensate this trend. By the way, we have assumed that shooting first we have assumed that A, B gives an advantage to A, but what should have happened if it would give an advantage to B? If the A, B order would benefit B, what should be the next penalty par to compensate this advantage? Now we have to change the order again. If the order gives an advantage to A or to B, if there is some advantage systematically, any advantage, whether it's to A or to B, then the next pair should be the, should change the order. And then if A, A, B does not give an advantage to any of the elements, when I change it, I'm not changing everything. So the second pair of penalties should be B, A. This is clear. What happens with the f four next penalties? Well, maybe we have not compensated all the advantage of A. Maybe A, B, B, A st is still giving some advantage to A or B. 
we have not compensated it enough or we have overcompensated then we have to think what happens with the next four penalties again we should change the order again if a b b a is given an advantage then we have to change the order of the whole sequence to b a a b this way we compensate so what we have to do if there is any advantage in the design we have to change the order of the design and if this is good because if there is no advantage when i change the order i'm not affecting anything then what happens with the next eight? Again, we have to change the order of the whole sequence. This is the optimal thing to do. But this sequence is complicated. This first one is easy to understand, but the rest is weird. One B, two Bs, two As. Public won't, under, won't understand that. Maybe it is beautiful from the scientific point of view for compensating the trend of the order. By the way, this is the sequence that's uh, very well known in science because it can be seen in nature pretty often. The name is Bruhet True Morse sequence. This is the optimal sequence that minimizes the psychological effects generated by the order. There is another solution which is more applicable. We change the order once of A, B, B, A, and instead of changing the order always, we repeat A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, continually. This is the sequence used in tennis. In the tie breaks, they use this sequence. I have not been able to document the reason why they started using this in tennis for tie breaks in the 1960s or 1950s. And I'm sure that this is based on the belief that serving is an advantage. So an act, a current proposal at the FIFA is that the order, the sequence for the penalty series should be changed to that of the tie breaks in tennis. So this is a third aspect where an economist that's studying penalty series from a scientific point of view can contribute to make them more fair. I still have about 10 minutes. So I will, by the way, by the, the question whether this is moldable or changeable can be answered with the Argentinian league because for one year they did something very weird. Whenever there was a match that ended in a draw, there was a penalty series. So every week there was penal there were penalty series, and so players got trained at shooting penalties. Then, because normally a football player will not play a penalty series, but if you do it every week, the psychological effect of the pressure, if you're losing, you're winning, is it moldable? But then, in Argentina, when people are trained to overcome the psychological effect, what would be the results? The results were 50-50, not 60-40 anymore. So it is it is moldable. It's a situation with uh, emo emotional pressure in a competitive situation, and it's moldable. The fourth theory is an area that has studied about five years ago, which is neuroeconomics. 
We're economists, we believe we are doctors, and we try to document in the brain not only things that are important for medicine, but also for economics, like risk-taking, patients, the recursive induction ability of human beings, and basically, you can do all lab situations, you can scan many things in a scanner machine. We are scanning the brain with the subject is taking decisions that are important for economics and try to locate where is the risk taking, the uncertainty, the patients, variables that are important for economics. And this is an area that I I'm sure that there will be a Nobel Prize in this area over the next 10 years. I've contributed in my area trying to locate NASH in the brain because we know what has to happen. And I'd like to comment that this area in this area, the aspects of human behavior that go beyond medical aspects can be located with a scanner machine while subjects are taking economic decisions. And this has huge potential, huge pot potential that goes beyond the medical potential and possibilities. Last I wanted to see how economics can help football. Not only football can help economy, but also the other way around. An economist can use his knowledge to help football. I have taken part in a few situations where where economic theories have helped to solve social or sport problems. The first question that we saw in the media some years ago, and we saw how, economist, how an economist can help to solve a football issue, is how to change the uh, members of a football club from one stadium to the new one. There was a huge issue to relocate the members from one stadium to the other. Who should choose first the seat? What happens when I want my family sit beside me and my friends, but then there's other people that they want other people there, other families. So there are some property rights that are related with seniority. So it's a very complex situation. I think this was a huge success, the way we did it. And it was done in relation with problems solved by Alvin Roth, the Nobel Prize, matching problems. How to allocate this, this man, Roth, received the Nobel Prize for solving very complex, uh, complex problems like how to allocate kidneys in a hospital, how to allocate people to social housing, how to allocate or assignate, how to assign patients to rooms in hospitals. There are many matching problems where you have not only to assign but also to be selected. You have kind of create a market. So normally the problem of relocating members of a football club, when members, they are interested also not only in their seat, but the seats, the seats around their seats. And there's a feeling that seniority should be important. And also there's a feeling that nobody's going to 
uh, get something worse. How to assign seeds without using prices and without a selling market. So this is very similar to the problems of Alvin Roth, a little bit more complicated. Well, the problem of the Athletic Club de Bilbao, the football team, is more, is more com complicated. I met Roth in the United States. He told me this is very Now he's explaining in English. Y dice, son dos problemas que yo he tratado de una manera diferente, separadamente. Por una parte, el problema del vecino, el rumbo... Yeah, there are different problems, like the kidneys of the neighbor assignment, where the tenants have some rights. Then we were thinking for a few weeks with the cooperation of Alvin Roth, and we implemented a procedure. If you are members of the athletic club, you are already familiar with it, but I will explain it anyway, because it's very simple. The procedure is very simple. It was perceived as fair by the members. It is not perfect, but almost and the efficiency proprieties are very high, and there was a great success. There were almost no complaints out of 36,000 members of the athletic club. And this is a situation where an economist uses algorithms over, or a way of thinking, an approach, that's an economic approach, to solve a social or athletic problem. Where is the relation between assigning kidneys and relocating members of a foot football team? Well, it is the same problem, actually. And we see how economic theory can help football. And the last example of how economy can help football is related with an athletic situation that we saw last year. Last year, we played, or, or the year before last year, we played in a stadium that was U-shaped. And the question is, the, the sport question is, can a U-shaped stadium, a U-shaped court have an effect? meaning what goal is better. So where the asymmetry of the stadium can have an effect? Well, this is a question that we cannot answer with data from San Mames, but we can answer them based on data of similar stadiums, like the one of Vallecas, which is U-shaped. There is one site which is not built. And the question is, what is happening in Vallecas? Is there a goal that's better than the other one? Well, with some econometric data and with data and techniques, we can get rid of the goal effect. We can take it, pick it out of other effects that would be aspects that might have an effect. And then we need to know if the goal is important or not. Well, we did this and we found after analyzing into detail what has happened with Rayo that once you take away all the effects in Vallecas, you see more goals on the goal that's on the site that's not built. That goes both for Rayo and for the visiting team. For Rayo, it's a 6% more taking away other 
effects and a 4% for the visiting, visiting team. If we translate this into goals scored, it's not very much. It's plus 1.6 per season for Rayo, 1.2 per season for the visiting team. So this goal is better in this sense uh, or to this extent during a year. Is that enough? I don't know if a goal is enough. But it seems that the average result in Vallecas, if you measure all the goals against and for Rayo Vallecano, is 147-144. That's the mean result, the average result. Then the average points won by the team in Vallecas is 1.43. This is the average result. It is the average point. So the goal <coughs> effect, which is 1.6 and 1.2, is higher than the average result, which is 1.43. So the goal effect in a season is between one point and a half and two points. We have translated this from goals into points. Now let's translate it into money. What? How? How much is a point worth? We've got sixty. Uh, we have a budget of sixty million euros. We got sixty points, so it's one million, one million per euro. 1 million euros per point, sorry. So for, then it seems it is important. So taking the right decision of choosing which goal in terms of points, in terms of goals or in terms of money has an impressive impact because um, the volume, the, the the figures in football are impressive. So in terms of money, we are dealing with huge volumes. So we have to be careful that if we see something that at the beginning we might think is not significant, it actually has impressive consequences. And this way I wanted to show you how an economist can help football. The goal of this presentation was a double goal, double message. First is economy is not what, as we perceive it, is very similar to physics. Of course, um, it is related with economy, with Greece, with the crisis, etc. But economic science studies human beings. We might be using math to write economic theories and also with data. The data, we don't care where the data come from. If you like football, football is fine. But if you are American, when I was able to demonstrate Nash's theory, they don't care where the data come from. They are impressive data because they are able to validate a theory. So we don't care about the origin of the data. And then the last point is that football in particular and sports in general only um, or are for many reasons ideal, are ideal grounds for proving economic theories due to the richness of data that we can have. So if economy is not exactly what one thinks it is, also neither is football. So if you like football and sports, I hope that 
I've explained which is the way that uh, we economists to see the, the world of football. We think of Nash, when we see a penalty, when we see tennis, we think of uh, Kahneman or, or the algorithms, algorithms of change of Alvin Roth. When we see a scanner image of a decision-making experiment, when there's a goal right before halftime, we think how it affects a market. This is the way how some economists think, and I hope that this won't change the way you see and enjoy sports. But I just wanted to convey to you the way I think about football, and that was the goal of my presentation. So thank you very much.